Good morning and aloha everyone joining us today. Um, my name is Mimi Fuchs and I am so excited to be here with you today for another installment of the Women in Space Exploration Talk series. This incredible outreach experience is hosted by Pisces and wouldn't be possible without our sponsors, the Hawaii Science and Technology Museum and Microsoft. All throughout this week, we are having the opportunity to, to speak with incredible women working in the fields of the aerospace industry. In addition to their presentations, we have the opportunity to ask them all our most pressing questions about what it means to work in this field. So, as you listen to this presentation, don't hesitate. Feel free to send along any questions you have into our question and answer session. If you use the hashtag WISE, um, we'll be sure to answer it. We are um, requesting you use that hashtag if, um, in particular, if you're a young woman under the age of 25 interested in pursuing a similar career path. Without further ado, I want to introduce you to today's really awesome speaker. We are here with Dr. Veronica Bindi, um, a professor of physics and astronomy at the University of Hawaii Manoa. Her main research topics are the study of dark matter, cosmic rays, solar modulation of cosmic rays, solar energetic particles, and space radiation to help us better understand future human space missions. She received her doctorate in physics at the University of Bologna in Italy, and she worked at CERN um, from in 2002 as a part of the team that constructed and integrated the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer on the International Space Station. I'm so excited to hear Dr. Bindi tell more about her work. And so with that, I will hand it over to her. Please welcome Dr. Veronica Bindi. doctorate in physics at the University of Bologna in Italy, and she worked at CERN um, from in 2002 as a part of the team that constructed and integrated the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer on the International Space Station. I'm so excited to hear Dr. Bindi tell more about her work, and so with that, I will hand it over to her. Please welcome Dr. Veronica Bindi. Hello, hi. Doctorate in physics. At the University of Bologna. Okay. They sound great and look great. Um, in 2002, I'm part of the team that constructed and integrated the Alpha Magnetic Hi, Spectrometer. Hi, I have some problem with the audio. I'm so excited to hear Dr. Billy tell more about her work. So I can hear that, again I'll the presentation. Please welcome Dr. Veronica Bindi. Yeah. It, Hi. Hi, Veronica. It, it might you might have a window open for the presentation, like the attendee presentation. Do you see a window? It might you might have a window open for the presentation, like the attendee presentation. Do you found it. <laughs> Hello, can you hear okay. me? Okay, great. You're, we can hear you. You okay. are live. So I was able to fix the audio. Yes, as you said, I had the window open. So please let me know when I can start and uh, I will be happy to start. Although I do not see my slides. Oh, here they are. Whenever you're ready, I think our audio issues are resolved, so take it away. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good, okay. I I cannot see the, the end of my slide. If you are able to put it a bit up, that will be awesome. Um, yeah, okay, that's perfect. Okay, good morning everyone. I'm very, very happy and pleased to be here and to make this presentation in this amazing uh, meeting and uh, talk series that you have. 
So uh, thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, I'm Veronica Bindi, as I was said, and I'm a physics and a professor at the physics and astronomy department here at the University of Hawaii. And today I'm going to present space weather and space radiation for future human space missions. If you can go to the next slide. Please. OK, so just to give a bit of introduction, we know that human desire for exploration leads to discovery. Next slide, please. And that in the past, the navigation was essentially done using stars. So since the very, very ancient time, we are looking at the stars to um, to understand and where to go, essentially. Next slide. And Polynesian actually were the first one to use the star to navigate. They were using also additional things like the weather or the, the, the movement of the birds and so on, but they were the first one to use the stars. And next slide, please. Uh, using the stars, uh, they were able to arrive um, about 400, 500 before Christ to um, our beautiful, beautiful island. So the Polynesian had a long history of exploration and settlement on other islands, and they believed that the brightest stars indicated the position of the islands. So following the Ukulea stars, they found the beautiful island of Hawaii. Next star, next uh, slide, please. So this is a beautiful picture of Kauai. Next. And here, just to give you an idea, this is a world map from 1482. So I don't know about you, this map is called Marcatore, and it's a very popular piece of art in Italy. And uh, I don't know about you, but it's very, very complicated to distinguish the world we know of right now. Uh, so we can barely see some of the states that we, we know already. So you see that the world was completely different in 1482. So if you can go next. So it's thanks to very good explorers. They risk their lives to go versus the unknown and they, they, they bring knowledge to all of us. So here we have only a few of them, but that they were, there are many, many more of them. And if you can go next, it's thanks to them that now the world is uh, the way we know it. So next, please. So ancient Polynesian, Columbus, Magellano, Marco Polo and other explorers were considered like today we consider astronauts. So also for those explorers, people were asking them, but why do we need to, to go there? We already have here everything we need, but why? We haven't solved the problems of this world. So why we should go to space? why we should go to different countries, why we should discover this and that. So astronauts now, they are going through the same kind of question for many, many people. But in the reality, as we said before, if you want to, is from explorations, you really uh, improve your knowledge and you get to know better the place where we live. Next, please. So it's with Yuri Gagarin in 1961 that the first, the first man in space. He was a Russian guy. You see here the picture of the astronauts and you also see that he was covering all the first page of the, of the news at that time. Please, next. And then to the moon, we had uh, several missions, so from the Apollo 11, which is of course the most important one because the first man on the surface of the moon, and then we have Apollo 12 and all the other, um, at, and all the other times that humans were able to land on the moon. But after that, as we know, um, our space, um, uh, the idea of the space travels changed, so we were busy doing something different and uh, we established, for example, the International Space Station, which is orbiting around our planet um, since many years now. And so we didn't go back to the moon. And if you go, can go to the next slide. And uh, ah, here is still a, a beautiful picture of the Apollo mission to the moon. Please, next. 
So now, if we look at the present and the future, what we really want to do is to the Artemis mission, what is called the Artemis mission. So this is an ongoing uh, space mission that is run by NASA. And sorry, but I see again that is uh, cropped. The, the the slide so if you could decrease a bit the um yes unzoom just a bit oh awesome and so um this mission that is led, run by nasa uh, will have the goal to land in the first female astronaut uh, finally a first female will be able to go to the moon and then the next astronaut, male astronaut in the moon South Pole by 2024. So what do we want to do with the Artemis mission? Next slide, please. So there will go three uh, steps. The first step, it will be the SLS rocket, uh, which is what uh, replaces the space shuttle that will launch on an uncrewed Orion, Orion into her orbit. Then we are going to have a second mission, Artemis 2, and this will be the first crewed flight of SLS and Orion. And in this case, we'll send astronauts to the lunar environment for the first time in more than 50 years. And with the Artemis 3, instead, we, we are going to have that Orion and its crew of four will once again travel to the moon. And so, they will get to the surface of the moon. Next, please. So this time, um, as I mentioned before, we are going to use SLS, which is this uh, uh, huge rocket that you see here, is the biggest rocket uh, that we ever had. And then we are going to use Orion, is the capsule where the module where they're going to be the astronauts located. And then we are going to have the gateway, which is a sort of international a space station, uh, but this time is um, rotating around the moon. Next slide, please. So with also what we are going to have once we get to the lunar gateway, we have to get to the surface of the moon. So we are going to have a lunar landing system, and this is going to be done by commercial partners. So one of these three designs should be selected in these days to decide which one between SpaceX or Dynetics or uh, Blue Origin, who is going to be the one that brings um, the, the astronauts from the lunar gateway to the surface of the moon. Next slide, please. Then here is another picture of the lunar gateway. At the beginning, we are going to have a very simplified version, but then it's going to be extended in the following years because this time we want to go to the moon to stay. So the key word is that not only to get to the surface, because this we already did it in the past, but this time we want to have really uh, something, uh, a base where we can stay. And indeed, if you go to the next slide, we are going to have what is called the Artemis Base Camp. So we want to have uh, several, um, several experiments on the surface of the moon. Um, NASA has already selected last year um, commercial partners for various experiments on the surface. And, um, and in addition, we are going to have all the NASA uh, science uh, experiment on the surface. Go next, please. So what is the ourselves? Is it safe for humans to live on the moon or Mars? And uh, how can we do that? And is the space empty? So if you go to the next slide, please. So in space, in the reality, without the protection of our atmosphere, the astronaut needs some type of shielding from the radiation. Um, you probably have already heard what the radiation is, and I'm going to explain a bit better later on in the slides. Next slide, please. So you just need to imagine that between Apollo 16 and 17, there was a very, very strong solar event, and that would have caused acute radiation sickness. So thank God no astronauts were in space at that time, but it would have been very complicated if they would have been there. So you can imagine that if we want to stay there, we have to find some solution. Next, please. 
and indeed, which are the effect on radiation? So, so the effect on radiation are multiples. Uh, they are all negative. It's the same effect that you have in radiation here on ground. So, for example, uh, if you think about Fukushima or other very um, Hiroshima, so all these type of events, but the difference is that in space you don't have such explosive high energy, but you have uh, um, lower amount of energies, but for an extended and continuous period of time. So at the end, what you have, you have damages in the DNA and uh, this can bring a lot of sickness. So we need to protect our, our astronauts, of course. Let's go to the next one. So uh, space, as I was saying before, is filled with radiation. But what is radiation? Although it's called space radiation, it's not composed by rays, but it's composed by particles. These particles are very, very tiny particles that are known as cosmic rays. So let's understand a bit better. Uh, please, next. So how do we know, first of all, that cosmic rays exist? So we can know some of the effects of cosmic rays because we can see them even by naked eye. Indeed, can you identify the picture that is here? Is an aurora borealis. So the aurora borealis and aurora australis appear in the night when cosmic rays from the sun enter our atmosphere. So what we see here, this beautiful uh, image of the aurora is caused by cosmic rays, by the presence of this radiation of these particles. Go next. So now that we know that this particle exists, next slide please. How can we measure cosmic rays? So we have an instrument called the alpha magnetic spectrometer and here you see a picture, please go a bit back, back in the beautiful picture of before. So this is a picture that has been taken by the external arm of the International Space Station and it shows our the location of our instrument. So this one that you see on the top written AMS. Go next. Next. Yes, AMS is an international collaboration. So we were um, 15 countries and people from 46 institutes working in this project. The, all the different countries are highlighted with different colors. And so as you see, uh, there is US with uh, MIT, but also with NASA and of course the University of Hawaii. But then we have a lot of uh, countries in uh, Asia and also in Europe. Please, next. So we built it, uh, our instrument for about 10 years. This is a picture of myself when I was really, really young and a student. And already at that time we, we were participating, I was participating to the construction of the instrument that occurred at CERN in Switzerland. And uh, it's a very general purpose particle detector that is used, the same technique are used in the accelerators, if you ever heard of them, which are these big laboratories that they, where they collide particles and they find the constituent of matters. Next, please. And so the, the instrument, if you want some more details, this is the location on the space station. So the space station, just to give you an idea, is big as a football uh, field and um, is 400 kilometers on the top of our um, ground sea level. And as I say, the, uh, it's pretty big and then the orbit is uh, 90 minutes. So every 90 minutes, it makes an entire turn of our planet. So they see sunrise, sunset, sunrise, sunset all day long. Can you imagine how beautiful that is? <laughs> and then uh, here there is our instrument. So the dimension is uh, 16 feet by 13 feet by 10 feet, is about seven tons, so 15,000 libs, and the power is 2.4 kilowatt. So just a bit more than your dryer, air dryer. Next slide, please. So here I give you another idea of the dimension. This is our instrument and close to it, there are two astronauts that are working and performing some activities on the space station. 
So we installed our instrument in May 2011, and since that time we collected over 160 billions of particles. So we have lots and lots of statistics. Please, next. What are cosmic rays? So we measure essentially all the type of matter that exists here on Earth, like hydrogen, helium, all the type of elements, and 79% of nuclei of hydrogen. And then we have 14% which are nuclei or helium, and then 7% are heavier elements, such as uh, carbon, iron, and other elements. Please, next. So the different composition of these particles, you see that some of these particles are more abundant than other, makes you to understand the, com the composition of our um, solar system. And uh, not only of our solar system, because we need to understand who are the progenitors of these particles, who put these particles in space in the first place. But as you see, they give you some information about the mechanism that were used to produce these particles because we have very different percentage of them. Please, next. So where do cosmic rays come from? You might have an hint from the back, uh, from the background here, go next. So cosmic rays, this space radiation is provided by supernovae. You see here beautiful images of supernovae remnants. So very, very big stars, which are 10 times our sun. At the end of their life, they just explode. They make a big explosion. And from this big explosion, we have lots of materials that get ejected into the universe. And this material that get ejected compose um, cosmic rays. So when astronomers look at these pictures, why we just see them and we just think that they are very gorgeous, for them, all the different colors represent different energy that is ongoing. So these are the shock waves, and in these shock waves, you have uh, the acceleration of the particles that then get ejected everywhere. And also where you see here all this matter inside, when after it, it uh, starts, uh, dies, in the reality here we have a nursery of a lot of new stars. So here we have new stars that take place with new solar system and hopefully new planets and hopefully a uh, new life. Okay, just to give you an idea. So let's go next. But cosmic rays, this radiation is also pro provoked by our sun. And here is a beautiful image of our sun. What you see here, where there is very bright, is a solar flare. You might have heard already about this term. Sometimes you, you hear it at, over the news. And this one instead that comes out is called a coronal mass ejection. So sometimes also in the sun, is like here, you have a different weather. Here you have a different weather and the same is over the sun. So you have seasons, the seasons in the sun are longer. You, you have a very high activity and very low activity. And when you have a very high activity, uh, you have lots of solar flares and this coronal max, max ejection, which are um, essentially the plasma of the sun that in a big explosion get ejected into outer space. Next slide, please. To give you an idea of the dimension, this is the relative size of our planet with, with respect to one of these phenomena. So they are very, very strong. Thank God we are far away enough. But so then we have lots of particles called solar energetic particles because they are emitted by the sun. And we measure 28 events of that since 2011. Please, next. So our planet, um, as you know, we have lots of iron, we have lots of heavy elements, so we have also strong magnetic field. So it's like a magnet. And because of the magnet, all these particles, they get deflected by our magnetic field. But then if you go to the moon or Mars, where the magnetic field do not exist or is not as strong as here, the particles do not get deflected. So you can 
actually get exposed to all these particles. Next slide, please. So here, just to give you an idea of the radiation, you see from the beginning of our mission, May 2011, in the left bottom corner, and then in the right bottom corner, you say May 2018. So this is all the time that we were taking data. Actually, I should update this plot and put two additional years. Um, what you see here is the flux of particles. So the amount of radiation and the amount of radiation, you see that at the beginning of the mission, it was a certain amount, then it decreased because we went through what is called the solar minimum of the solar activity. And then now we are going through toward the solar maximum of the solar activity. Please go next. So as you see, we have seasons also in our sun. And so when you plan a mission to go to the moon or Mars, you should consider also that because, for example, here, can you go a bit more higher? So here we can see where I can see the years. OK, never mind. So here we can see the yearly variation from 2013 to 2017. At the bottom, we see the year 2013 and at the bottom, at the top, we see here 2017. So as you see, we have 300% more radiation if you would go to the moon in 2017 rather than in 2013. So also this type of things, you need to do it when you are planning a new mission to space. Go next. And here you have uh, some time variation of the cosmic rays, but this time you see it um, in our on the top of our planet. So you see how much is more concentrated closer to the polar regions rather than in the equatorial regions. And then we see here on the top of uh, South America that we have an anomaly in our magnetic field. And so we, we can see that also here there are lots of uh, trapped particles, lots of radiation. Go next. So how can astronauts survive for a long period of time in outer space? The solution is if we are able to forecast and tell the astronaut when is the best time to go and to let them know if there are solar energetic particles from the sun because the sun is very active. And so like this, the astronaut can go in a the, in a sheltered space for a period of time and um, any sheltered areas. So they can go, as you see here, uh, the astronaut laughing inside the place, which is as a lot of shielding or just getting inside one of the what is going to be a moon village, a possible moon village. Go next. So what do we do at the University of Hawaii? What we do, we work, we collaborate with NASA Space Radiation to provide health assessment and shielding design. Uh, we are focused on, uh, on the AMS and in the energy range that support NASA human space exploration missions. What we are doing is, with our results, we are, they are used to improve models employed to predict the radiation dose absorbed by an astronaut for both ISS operations and also for long duration missions to the moon and Mars. And last but not least, also the technologies in space, which are now part of our everyday life, uh, because you need to imagine satellites for mobile communication, uh, GPS, so the GPS timestamps are used constantly. Uh, imagine that in, a, in every credit card transaction, you need a GPS timestamp to assign a value of the, of the money at the time. So the space, the space is now is so crucial um, because we have all this asset there. So the study of space weather and its forecast, as I was saying, is crucial to extend this, the lifetime of our assets in space. And so what we do is becoming more and more important. If you want to have more information, you can go and log into our website. Please next. So some final remarks. 
Uh, discoveries requires technical solutions that do not exist, embracing multidisciplinary aspects. So what you see in what we do is physics, engineering, astronomy, architecture, agriculture, medicine, everything, because we need also to, to bring these people up there safely and bring them back home. In, uh, and all this is done in a cooperative way. And science is nourished by creativity that is particularly necessary to overcome all the challenges. And often the solutions find applications that are different from the original purpose, and this results in human advancement. And then you have to consider that people all over the world are working together to face the challenge of long-term space travel. So it's a very, very interesting and important field where you really get to collaborate with people in a cooperative way. And if you can go to the next slide. Please. Next. Thank you. So no matter how beautiful is the universe, but our planet is unique and provide lives to us and to many other species. So we really, really need to protect it and to, um, yeah, to enjoy our journey in this planet. Uh, I don't know how long it was, but this is essentially the end of my presentation. So if you have any questions, I'm very, very happy to, to answer your questions. Dr. Bindi, thank you so much. That was such an incredible presentation. I have so many questions. I know the folks tuning in have so many questions. Um, so this is a reminder to everybody who's just listened. If you have a question for Dr. Bindi, feel free to send it along to us. Um, so there's a separate chat window that's called the question and answer window. And that is the venue for typing your question and sending it off to us. Um, Dr. Bindi, I was hoping um, that you could reflect a little bit on the steps that it took in order to um, have the career that you have right now as a professor who gets to do this really exciting research. Um, what inspired you to get interested in astronomy and physics? And did you always know that you wanted to teach and do research? OK, so um, this is a very good question. Many times uh, my students ask me these questions and uh, well, I guess that everybody has a different story, have a different path. And uh, in my case, I really like um, space since I was a kid because I'm from a very, very tiny little village in Tuscany in the, from the countryside. So believe me when I tell you that the, one of the few things that they were very amazing for me was just to look at the stars outside. So there was no movie theater, you know, in my little village. There were no many distractions, at the, especially at the time. Even now, actually, there are not that many in that place. It's beautiful, but not that many things. And uh, so the stars were just unbelievable there. And then I lost completely, uh, yeah, interest in the sense that I was more into um, something more normal. I was not considering this career path as a possibility. I was just thinking, oh, you need to be a genius. No, you need to be the best in your class. So no, I cannot do these things. But then when it was the time to decide for college, I was like, but this is really the things I like at the end. So I don't care if people think that it's an uncommon career path. If I will never perhaps find a job at the end, so who cares? At least I give it a try. And then it worked out at the end. It worked out very, very well. So I ended up doing every more than I ever imagined. Believe me, when I was a kid, if you would have told me, oh, you would become a professor, you would go to NASA, work with astronauts and do travel in the world, I would have looked at you and say, you are completely out of your mind. <laughs> but, you know, it happened. So, <laughs> yeah, so I hope to give uh, hopes to, to many students in the audience. Absolutely. Um, what advice would you pass along to someone who's maybe in high school or maybe just starting college who's interested in astronomy and physics and maybe would like to pursue a similar path? 
so I would um, I would suggest that at the end uh, to achieve a very high level in your job, you need to to love it. You need to put a lot of time. You are going to face lots of difficulties and also lots of bad times. So you really need to love what you are going to do. And um, and so it doesn't really matter how many money you can make with something or something else. As long as you think I'm going to work hard because you will need to work hard for this type of uh, things if you want to excel in your job. But this is in all fields. And then uh, try to uh, for example, when if you decide to sell to um, I got my PhD, my um, degree in astronomy and then I did my PhD in physics. So if you decide to follow this path, do it not for just for the score at the end, but do it because you want to learn. And so it's important for you to learn because you are building up your skills. You are putting there your skills, so it doesn't really matter if the, the your classmate is better than you in certain things or certain others or um, but try to understand to build up your muscles and bones because then you will need them in your career. So and and try to finish and to focus and concentrate in your study so that you can finish as soon as possible because the work that you are going to do after is way more fascinating and nice and you will enjoy way more than just staying reading a book and studying what somebody else did. At that moment, you will be the actor that will do things. So you will be in charge. And so then is when you start the fun. So make the, you, the, the time in college as quick as possible. Learn as much as possible and make it as quick as possible because then when you start to work, it's going to be well, so much easier, you know, and nicer because you, you get rewarded from what you do and you don't have the same frustration that you have when you just study in your little room and you get ready for your exam. It's a different thing. Then you get to know colleagues and work together, team effort and and do very challenging things, but also super cool things. Yes. And as you mentioned, you know, I think that you get to this place in your career also where um, you have proof that you're able to make it. I think it's really easy when you're just starting in school to, to be just as you said, to compare yourself constantly to classmates, to feel like this is really challenging and not always exactly what you want to do. And I can understand how that really is um, allows people to lose motivation. But I'm really inspired by what you said, which is that you just really got to get through it because then you can start doing more exciting projects to you and start working within um, a greater professional environment that's going to carry you even further yes. um, than your studies yes. alone. Then um, you will learn a lot and you will really enjoy the journey. Although sometimes, you know, you, you find difficulties or people uh -huh. that make your life a bit more complicated, some colleagues that, you know, it, it's always a, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you need to work hard and it's not every time um, the, the, I mean, you don't find every time the, the solution to your problems or to your, uh, what you want to achieve. Sometimes you have some delays or sometimes you are waiting for somebody else to finish the things, but yeah it's a uh, it's part of the job so then it's really nice yeah challenge is part of the success absolutely yes. um i was hoping that we could turn to um talking about some of the subject matter you covered in your talk because we're getting a lot of questions about these lunar gateways um and the ways they might work within the ex existing space infrastructure so would you um, remind us the advantages of having um this access to the moon and how it might coexist with that International Space Station or maybe um, uh, replace certain aspects of the space station? Yes. So let's say that the International Space Station is a great laboratory, which is very nearby, so very convenient. But and there are um, it's like a gym. You go there to learn and to get some skills. 
But then the big deal, the real deal, is to go also somewhere else. And in this case, going to the moon is really, really important. We have already been there, but very briefly and with technologies that were not comparable with the technologies that we have right now. So we can learn so much more going to the moon with respect to what we learn about ourselves, because the moon has been around our planet for who such a long time and so it's like a it's like a virgin place untouched by humans where you can really learn part of the story that happened to our planet in a, such a significant way and then there is also another thing we all always need to think about the future so in the long term we know that this planet will be overpopulated more and more people will be here and so how can we face the challenge that we have here to provide uh, for everyone so we need new um, we need new technologies but we also need new resources i'm not saying that somebody will go to should move to live to the moon is not what i'm suggesting to make more space here in this planet but then eventually one day we will need to get some of the resources from the moon uh, to this planet to, to face the challenge that we face here. And, uh, you know, every time you try um, to do something in space is extremely complicated. It's way more complicated than you will do it here. So can you imagine to take a shower in space so if you are able to take a shower in space with the limited amount of water you have there, you certainly are going to be able to do it in the Sahara. Sahara is nothing compared to what you have, the challenge that you face in space, right? So if you see the perspectives uh, and, you, and if you see the similarities, when you face such a big challenge, then you could also be useful uh, for some of these extreme areas in this planet to make them a bit more comfortable for the people living there. So this, uh, this is essentially the reasons why we want to go back to the moon. So to learn more about ourselves, because in this planet we had a long history, so it's more complicated to understand. We went to the South Pole and also to the South Pole, we did exactly the same thing. At the beginning, humans went there, they just put the flag, a couple of samples, and they left. And then after many years, they get back there and they say, this is an amazing place where we can do fantastic science. And we discovered so many things about climate change, about the ozone hole and, and so on that is so important and we learned so much from our experience to the to the South Pole. And the same, I, I believe, or even more, we will learn going to the going to the moon. I am so excited. I personally really feel like in the next uh, in the next generation, the uh, efforts we are taking in order to be able to make it a little bit easier to get to the moon and get to places more distant in our solar system is just so promising and so exciting. Um, and I personally really believe that uh, our home here in Hawaii has a really big role to play in that. I'm so proud of the science and engineering that we're able to conduct on island and I'm very optimistic that it's going to be able to help us um, live and thrive in these inhospitable space environments. Um, and so I was hoping you could talk a little bit to that. You know, um, we know that on Mount Aloha and Mount Akea, we do some of these ex analog experiments in order to prepare us mm -hmm. for the hostile environments of outer space. Um, and yeah. so one of the questions we have actually um, speaks to the suggestion that potentially lava tubes on the moon or these other planetary surfaces could help shield us from some of this um, cosmic radiation. And so what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, this is actually a very, very good point. And indeed, I mean, is um, some of the scientists suggested that and they said, why don't we use the lava tubes exactly for this purpose? They could shield or there are other places, for example, when we were thinking to go to Mars, uh, also there, there is a huge canyon. And so we could go at the bottom of this canyon 
And uh, yeah, all these are possibilities and options. And of course, the more material you have in your on the top of your head, the more uh, you are safe. Although, um, yeah, you have always to find the sort of balance. So at the same time, you don't want to go there to live underground. Uh, you you also would like to uh, to be able to work uh, in, on the on the top of sur the surface. But it's definitely a possibility for the time being. We are because we do not have uh, such a strong robots to be able to. Um, yeah, to make villages underground or uh, or stuff like this. So the idea is to have uh, something which is um, inflatable. So where you can, uh, they are called active shielding. So uh, in addition to the shielding that you might already have, you also have something active that gets activated when you need it. So also drinkable water uh, when you, when it's necessary, you don't use it for drinking, but you just use it to fill in this uh, inflatable structure with the, and then you put the water because um, yeah, also this is very promising. So there are several options. And of course, having something here on ground is so important because we need to, to test it first. So for this type of reasons, resources that we might have in Hawaii could be could be perfect to try to test to test here first the the technologies and uh, yeah in the the big island there are several laboratories and a very important experiment that conduct this type of research yeah i uh... I personally just feel very excited that Hawaii, I think, is really on the forefront of some of these emerging technologies and that we also see folks who um, are not from this island and don't necessarily have a connection to this island recognize the potential that we have for doing these kind of analog experiments to get us there a little bit quicker. Um, so we've talked a little bit about these shielding technologies that can protect us from cosmic rays, and that tends to be um, the current approach. Like we can shield our astronauts and the International Space Station um, from cosmic radiation, mostly for using uh, materials engineering. That they are these shields that will protect them from actually entering their body and harming them. Um, but as we see new technologies emerge and as we see more biomedical engineering applications to understand our bodies and um, you know genetic changes, are we seeing any biomedical engineering solutions that potentially could provide um, some sort of therapies to astronauts once they're in space? Um, or are we seeing efforts to combat um, the harm from cosmic radiation um, from a medical perspective? Uh, well, so this is also a very important point. And um, um, certainly I think that for the long term uh, uh, space exploration, this is, should be in something that is a key because um, essentially if we would be able to modify or to help our body, to overcome all the damages caused by radiation, then that will be awesome, right? That would be amazing. So for the time being, although people are trying to uh, find new options, uh, there are some options, but there are not yet um, definitive things. But in the near future, uh, things sometimes change so fast. And so in the near future, we could, uh, I could give a different answer, you know. So I think it's a very promising um, area because uh, as you see, it's, um, it's a type of research that uh, is moving so forward so fast. And um, I believe that is really the, the future for many things, not only for the space radiation, but also for other type of disease. Um, so that could be a really, a really good thing. Yes. But yeah, Absolutely. so far we will need to, to wait a bit and to let the experts do their job. <laughs> yeah, and it speaks to this notion that we need people who have strong backgrounds, not just in physics and astronomy and engineering, but also um, with respect to human health and understanding these kind of harsh environments in order to help us um, come up with these solutions. Um, yeah. I really appreciated that you talked about how much of a challenge it is 
um, with respect to combating this cause of radiation, because as we see um, more advancements in the commercial space industry, this continues to be a problem that we have to tackle and we haven't really fixed it yet. Yes, um, yes. And sometimes, you know, also starting from nature, we find a lot of solutions in technologies just simply starting from nature because nature had so many years to adapt to solutions and to situations in a very clever way so sometimes we just uh, need to look outside and try to find uh, uh, maybe some species have already solved this problem and uh, so we just need to uh, try to adapt it to humans but uh, yeah, sometimes nature has the answer. So the answers are really around us. I It's going to be really incredible to see where we are 15 years from now in terms of our understanding of the effects that space has on the human body and the innovative techniques we've come up with to combat it. Um, I find it so exciting that, um, you know, I feel like astronomy is this golden age of exploration where our technology has really caught up with some of, so much of our theory and observational threat observational astronomy is really thriving. And I see this happening also with um, commercial space ventures. And I was wondering if you would just describe for all of us tuning in where we are with respect to the average person being able to get to space. We had a question about space tourism. And I guess I'm curious, when do you think the average person can get to space? Is space oh, hotels wow. going to be popping up anytime <laughs> soon? Like, what is your vision for this as an expert in the field? So this, my vision, well, from the field, but not really as an expert, because I don't know that much about the tourism. I guess I will have to wait since I'm not a millionaire. I never asked how it could go. <laughs> so, but I, I try, for example, to apply uh, as an astronaut. And unfortunately, I wasn't selected. So this is just to let you know that if somebody will ask me, oh, will you go to space? I would say, oh, yeah, let's do it. Would you go it. to Mars or somewhere that would be a longer mission? Oh, to Mars, uh, that would be that would be tough. Maybe not now, maybe in 15, 20 years from now. I want to enjoy a bit more <laughs> life in this planet before. <laughs> But because Mars is, uh, for the time being, it could be just one way tour, you know, one way. So yeah. I wouldn't probably go there, but for emissions to the moon, I would, or to the International Space Station, or also only like a space tourist, then I would do that. Yeah, definitely would do that. I think it's amazing to just see our planet from out there. And I spoke, I have so many astronauts that are friends of mine because we work it together for our instrument and every time I hear them and their stories is uh, is so fascinating it's uh, so out of this world you would say so <laughs> <it's amazing. laughs> but you know going back to the space tourism well in the past uh, when we went to the moon uh, essentially it was only Russia and then it was only United States and we are speaking about only governmental agencies but now no now is different now we have a uh, lots of different countries that are all participating and we have lots of commercial partners that are playing a key role in this uh, in this endeavor in this mission so all these commercial partners it's normal that they want also to build additional uh, toys to go up there and then why not if somebody wants to try um, I've heard that also Tom Cruise maybe for one of his movie will go up in outer space I mean Tom Cruise wow that's awesome <laughs> it, it makes me think about his Mission Impossible movies and uh, this time is possible apparently so it's turning into reality <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So it's um, it's amazing because you see, in the past we were thinking that they needed to be extremely fit to be able to go to space. Now we have seen normal people um, that are astronauts. I mean, they are amazing, but yeah, they don't. You don't need to be physically super super healthy. And um, uh, for example, also when John Glenn went for the second time, I don't know if it was. Uh, very 
sorry now for the people of that age. No, I wouldn't say old. I would say, um, yeah, not that young anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so he made it possible for you to say, oh, well, then I probably, you know, I probably could go too. So it, it's uh, it's amazing. And what is nice is that especially the, the people in the audience, the younger in the audience, so will see this world change so much and they could be the one going to space. Maybe not me, but maybe one of them. Why not? Or participating in this... Uh, amazing research and uh, travels, space travels. Absolutely, uh, and it's really incredible thinking about how quickly we've done it, you know? Um, the generation above me remembers when we landed on the moon and I grew up always knowing what's a possibility and uh, the folks who are growing up today and maybe some of the folks who are here um, always knew there was astronauts in the International Space Station. And so we we're just like continuing to build this, um, this human record of continuing to push forth our advancements in outer space with every generation. Um, it is just really exciting. Um, we have time for one last question, and this is a question that we've gotten every single day and we haven't had time to answer it. And so I was wondering if you could, um, if there's any rocket launch or space mission that was particularly inspiring to you um, that you want to just share with us. So, um there is one in particular, actually, which is Voyager. So Voyager was uh, sent in outer space in 1977, I think. Um, so very long time ago, and Voyager is still taking data. So they are two, actually. They are measuring uh, particles and uh, other things. They have also a part of DNA, human DNA, because at that time they were thinking maybe some aliens will see this spacecraft and will do something. So after so many years, they are still taking data, sending invaluable data to, to our planet, which takes quite some time. To, to receive the data and they just got outside. It was, I, I believe, a couple of years ago. They got outside from our solar system, which is incredible. So if you think when they were sent out with the simple technologies ever, uh, one evening I was at dinner, I was at an official dinner and there was a person close to me. I didn't know him. I didn't have an idea. We were speaking about, oh, what do you do? What do you do in your work and so on? And then it, I ended up um, speaking to Ed Stone. So Ed Stone was the guy that designed Voyager. They put it out in space. And I was like, are you, are you kidding me? Are you Ed Stone? <laughs> the father of Voyager, and he was like, yes. And I said to him, but so when did you send your spacecraft out? Where did you know that it would have lasted for so long? Did you have idea that you would have taken data? I said, oh no, I was thinking if we can get to three, four years of data, I'm going, you know, to open the best bottle of champagne I have in my place and celebrate because I said, okay, I've done my job. So <laughs> Not expecting that. I mean, something is dreaming that uh, your instrument in space will last forever. But then, uh, actually happening, it's a different story. Because you, as you know, there in space, everything could happen, and you cannot replace anything. You cannot just call the guy and say, "Hey, oh, can you go and replace, uh, you know, a light bulb because it's broken?" No, <laughs> you cannot do that. So. It's uh, it's incredible. So I was really, really inspired by Voyager. And actually, when I got my position at the physics department, and then I was every time I was like, oh, I would love to make another Voyager with the current technologies to go out and just measure all sorts of things and go outside the the solar system and everybody was telling me veronica this is a kind of a billion more than a couple of billion dollar um experiment so i doubt that in your career path at this time somebody is going to give you so much so much money you know to, 
to make such an experiment. So keep it for yourself, your idea. <laughs> but you know, one day, who knows? Maybe I will make the next generation of Voyager. <laughs> No doubt that if that's your goal, you can make it happen. Um, I thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation and for such a fruitful question and answer session. Um, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and expertise and um, enthusiasm for your work. Really okay. big mahalo, mahalo nui loa. Um, and thank you everyone who tuned in with us today. We've come to an end of our, um, of our presentation and question and answer session. Um, a big, big thank you to Dr. Veronica Bindi for being here with us today. A big thank you to Pisces for helping host this really wonderful event. Thank you to our sponsors, uh, the Hawaii Science and Technology Museum and Microsoft. And don't forget, the fun continues tomorrow and Friday. Um, so tomorrow, please join us as we talk with Tracy Pratter. Um, and she's going to be speaking about how we can enable sustainable space exploration through off-world manufacturing. And folks, if you are here, we, we really want to make these better for you. So if you have the chance, um, there's going to be a link and a QR code um, for a feedback form. And uh, we really appreciate any input that you have um, that you can help share with us in order to make this program even better. Again, my name is Mimi Fuchs. It has been wonderful having you here with us today. And hopefully we'll see you tomorrow at 11 a.m. Hawaii Standard Time. Bye. Mahalo. Mahalo.